Hey guys, welcome to my channel, 10 to Life. My name is Annie Elise, and I am bringing you full true crime cases in under 10 minutes. Ditching the boring storylines and empty plot information that really just drags out the case and giving you the key facts, the crazy details, and all of the insane twists and turns along the way. So if you like what you hear, please comment, share, like, review, and whether you're watching the video version of this on YouTube or listening to the podcast version, don't forget to subscribe to my channel by clicking that cute little subscribe button. If you have a major true crime addiction like me and you want more, head to my library for more cases, get your true crime Fix. Don't forget to follow me on social at underscore Annie Elise. And thanks for coming. Let's get into the case. It's a sunny day here in New York today, so I'm in full summer gear, got my neon eyeliner, and I am ready to go. So let's just jump right into the case. So today we are going to be talking about the ultimate douchebag, Gabe Watson. And you're going to clearly agree with me once you hear about this case. But we are going to be talking about Gabe Watson and his wife, Tina Watson. So Gabe and Tina met while they were in college at the University of Alabama in 2001, and they started dating shortly after meeting. And Tina actually loved Gabe so much that despite being diagnosed with a condition that causes shortness of breath and blacking out, she began diving lessons when they were dating because diving was such a big part of Gabe's life. She ended up earning her certification, and he himself was a rescue diver with over 55 dives under his belt. She ultimately made this huge sacrifice for him, and went into open water and started learning to dive because it was a hobby of his. I think that is amazing of her. That is very selfless. Tina and Gabe ended up getting engaged. Tina was very close with her family and her parents didn't exactly love Gabe, but they were welcoming to him because they knew Tina cared about him, but they always thought something was just a little bit off. So Gabe and Tina end up getting married on October 11th, 2003. She was 26 and he was 34 at the time. For their honeymoon, they decided they wanted to go to Australia. And of course, while they were there, they decided they would go on a dive because as I mentioned, diving was very important to Gabe. Tina wanted to explore that hobby with him. That's why she got her certification in diving. And so they had planned out this master honeymoon in Australia and included a dive at one of the most famous diving spots where you actually see a wreck underwater. They flew to Sydney the week before the dive and they did the normal sightseeing, the tours, everything just kind of relaxing and really gearing up to what this big actual excursion would be on their honeymoon. Like any excursion, the dive company offered an orientation and a full-on guide as to the safety issues and what to do, what not to do if you're ever in a bad situation, but they decided to opt out of that because they wanted more time to themselves to enjoy their honeymoon. Plus, since Gabe was a rescue diver, Tina relied on him and said, you know, I don't think I really need to go through these courses because you know what you're doing. I'm going to be with you and you'll take care of me. So on October 22nd, they go out on this beautiful diving excursion. They dive in the ocean. They're exploring the wreck. All the other divers that were on this group tour with them were taking pictures with their underwater cameras. Everybody's having a great time. Well, two minutes into the dive, Gabe says Tina gave him a look and this look shocked him to his core, he says, and it was this look of concern and terror. And she was flailing around and actually knocked his equipment off of his face and he says by the time he got his sight back and got his goggles on and could see straight, Tina was sinking to the bottom of the ocean. And Gabe says that she was sinking so fast, rather than go down after her and trying to get her, he decided, no, it's better if I just swim to shore, get help and get to the surface, have somebody else dive in after her, get a whole group to dive in after her, and that's what he did. He also stated that he had an ear problem, which made it difficult for him to dive deeper. And then he also says that even though he was a certified diver, he didn't have the training or the qualifications to actually do a rescue. Uh, hi, sorry, isn't that what a rescue diver is? So when Gabe came to the surface, he jumped on board a boat called the Spoil Sport, and he alerted the diving instructor, Wade, that Tina was sinking to the bottom. Wade brought Tina to the surface after 10 minutes of being underwater to an adjacent dive boat next to the Spoil Sport. A doctor tried to resuscitate Tina for 40 minutes and was unable to. And here's where things get a little bit weird. During that entire time, while they were trying to resuscitate Tina, Gabe remained on the other boat, adjacent to the boat that Tina was on. Uh, wouldn't you want to be with your wife as people are trying to resuscitate her because she was drowning? Why are you on a separate boat? Other witnesses report that while Gabe was on this other boat, as Tina, his wife, is on this boat getting resuscitated, that he had his head down and was making noises as though he was crying, but no tears were actually flowing, which struck people as very odd. Another thing, divers who are with the couple underwater say they witnessed Gabe giving Tina what they described as a bear hug as her arms were flailing, and when her arms stopped flailing, they saw Gabe shove Tina towards the ocean floor. The following day, an autopsy was done on Tina and it was ruled as a drowning. Due to Gabe's conflicting statements and to all this eyewitness testimony, police decided they need to do a little bit of an investigation into this. During the investigation, Gabe decided he was gonna return to the United States and although this investigation was taking place in Australia, they were constantly wanting him to come back to cooperate, to give statements, to give testimony, and he refused. 
Any statements or information he gave to them, he passed through his lawyer, but refused to go back to Australia. Which, again, if you just lost your wife, wouldn't you do anything in your power to help them solve this case, to put it to bed? Why are you being so reluctant to help? During the investigation, they had also pulled Gabe's dive computer, and every diver was required to have one of these. It basically shows all the metrics with your dive, your harpy, all, you know, all these things that are above my pay grade that I truly don't know anything about. But what I do know is that when they were analyzing this information, it didn't match Gabe's story. So after analyzing everything that was on this dive computer, what they determined was that Gabe turned off Tina's air supply and held her until she was unconscious, which is probably what happened when he was giving her that bear hug that the other divers described as seeing, then quickly turned the air back on and released her when he pushed her. Then resurfaced to the boat as a terrified husband. Something else that surfaced during this investigation actually came from Tina's father, and he says that Tina told him shortly before their wedding that Gabe had asked her to not only increase her life insurance policy, but make him the sole beneficiary. Well, okay, we've all heard this story and how it goes before. Anytime there's a money motive, we all know that it's usually the spouse who's guilty right? In March 2005, which was a couple years later, Gabe actually launched legal action in Alabama, their home state, to try to recoup the losses of the couple's trip, including traveler's insurance that didn't get paid out, accidental death compensation, medical expenses, phone calls, taxi fares, hotel bills, and additional damages for emotional anguish, totaled to $45,000. Are you kidding me? Again, your wife died a couple of years ago, regardless what the time frame is, and you're worried about recouping your lost money from your vacation, from your honeymoon. Tina's body was buried in Alabama, her home state, next to her family. But then in 2007, again, years after Tina died, her body was exhumed by Gabe, her husband, and laid to rest in a separate plot, which he didn't even tell her family he was planning to do that. So there, he takes her body, pulls it out of the ground, exhumes her body, which is pretty traumatizing and horrific for family members, and then takes it to a different plot not near her family. It is so cruel. Not to mention, he left her grave unmarked for six years. No tombstone, no nothing. It wasn't until 2009, and this, remember, this honeymoon happened in 2003. It wasn't until 2009 that she actually ended up getting a foot marker with her name on it where she was laid to rest. During all of this, investigators were informed by her family that at her gravesite, it was being vandalized. There were flowers, there were cards, there were signs that were not only destroyed and torn up, but then completely missing and gone. It happened so frequently that they ended up actually chaining certain flowers and pots and plants and things like that to the site, and somebody came around with bolt cutters removing it. Police end up putting up surveillance videos to see, okay, who is doing this and who is destroying this grave site? and removing all of this property and vandalizing it. And once they set those videos up, they see Gabe on camera with the bolt cutters going and destroying the site, picking up all of the flowers, all of the cards, and throwing them in trash cans. Items that her family left, items that her parents left. So then Gabe ends up remarrying a woman named Kim Lewis, who people describe as being Tina's doppelganger, which if you don't know what doppelganger means, it basically means exact twin. They apparently had a romantic history from high school when Kim was a junior and he was the star basketball player senior which this started to also prompt a little bit of speculation as to, okay, was this the motive as to why you wanted to kill your wife to be with this other woman who you have a history with? Everything just was piling on and not adding up. And finally, on June 19th, 2008, he was officially charged with murder in Australia. And after resisting extradition for over six months, he ended up returning to Australia in May 2009 to face the charges. At the trial on June 5th, 2009, he pleaded not guilty to murder, but guilty to manslaughter, which is the lesser charge. And then his statement following this kills me and it infuriates me because of how casual and disconnected it is. He says, and I quote, I pled guilty to basically not rendering proper aid to my diving buddy, unquote. How disconnected is that? It's as though he's saying, technically I'm admitting manslaughter because I didn't assist my diving buddy the way I should have. Uh, no bro, you didn't save your wife the way you should have. And not only that, you probably killed her by turning off her air supply. The prosecutor ended up pointing out to police that Gabe had given 16 different statements that conflicted with each other over the period of the investigation. And none of those statements matched what eyewitnesses saw. Eyewitnesses also had said that when Tina resurfaced onto the boat when they were trying to resuscitate her, that she had her regulator still in her mouth. Her tank still had air and all tests indicated there was no faulty equipment. Now this piece of information didn't surface for a while into the investigation, but as luck would have it, a fellow diver from that day named Gary was taking all of his underwater pictures of the beautiful ocean, the wreck, and in one of the photos, he captures Tina in the background. Now this picture ended up going viral, like super, super viral, because it shows Tina lying face up on the ocean floor. Gabe was sentenced to four and a half years in prison, but then it was suspended and he only served 18 months. 18 months for killing your wife. 18 months. 
Are you kidding me? Tina's family was, of course, outraged by this. And they went public and even said, this is an embarrassment to Australia. Are you kidding me right now? In May 2010, while Gabe was still in jail, it was announced that the United States decided, you know what, upon his release, we're gonna bring him back here and we're gonna charge him in Alabama because we think that this entire plot to kill his wife happened on US soil before they even got to Australia. So technically, it's our jurisdiction and we're retrying him. Thank God, finally, somebody's thinking with their head. So on November 25th, 2010, he was deported out of Australia and he was immediately arrested. And in 2011, the probate court removed Gabe as the administrator to Tina's estate and they appointed her father, rightfully so. And in that, he requested that all of her photos and yearbooks be returned because of course, that sentimental value of your daughter, you want that with you, not with this murdering husband of hers. And in true narcissistic fashion, Gabe appealed the ruling and refused to give an inventory list of Tina's belongings to the court. It blows my mind. At this point, you're remarried. You just got off pretty much with murder. Just give the family some closure and some peace and give them their child's belongings. What kind of monster are you? He was still pending trial in the United States at this point, and the court actually ordered him to stay away from Tina's grave, which that's a pretty big statement. To be ordered to stay away from somebody's grave, who, by the way, was your wife, clearly shows that they knew there was malice and ill intent behind everything. In the trial, Alabama judge Tommy Nail ruled that the evidence against Gabe regarding his behavior following Tina's death was ruled inadmissible. The judge also blocked Tina's father from giving evidence regarding the attempted increase into Tina's life insurance policy. Then on February 23rd, 2012, Gabe was acquitted. An Alabama judge threw out murder charges against Gabe Watson. And the reason was because they said lack of evidence. Are you kidding me? There is so much evidence and I get some of it, yes, maybe circumstantial, but even if it was enough evidence to go to trial in Australia, wouldn't it be enough evidence to also go to trial in the United States? The whole thing is just so ridiculous. So this case has been actually pretty controversial and everybody has different opinions that weigh into it. Most people say they're pretty certain of Gabe's guilt. I'm curious to know, what do you think? Do you think he's guilty or do you think there is a looming question mark over the entire situation? I personally think he's a douchebag, I think he's a killer, I think he's a narcissist. I mean, I could go on and on and on with what I think, but I'll leave that for a later day so that I don't get sued for defamation. So thanks for watching another case on 10 to Life. If you liked the video, you liked the channel, you liked the story, subscribe below, comment, like, share. Um, I have my email also in the description box. If you have any case recommendations, I would love to hear them. Shoot me an email. And thanks for joining, thanks for watching. Until next time, bye.